And now our story of the discovery of neutron stars takes an unexpected twist. We're going to switch from X-ray astronomy, which was one new technology of the time, to radio astronomy, another new technique of the time. We've talked about radio astronomy in its early days before, back in the first course in the series when we were talking about the discovery of quasars. And back then, one of the leading institutes for this radio astronomy was in the United Kingdom, the University of Cambridge, my alma mater. And some people there at the, at the Lord's Bridge Radio Observatory were trying to look not for neutron stars, but for what's called interplanetary um, scintillation. You know, if you look at a star at night, it seems to twinkle, and that's because of the bubbles of hot and cold air coming through the atmosphere. But it turns out that if you look at the radio waves from a distant quasar, they get a similar effect, not due to our own atmosphere, but actually due to bubbles of different differently ionized material moving around in the galactic wind. And they were planning to do this as so they came up with a new radio telescope. This radio telescope didn't, was, didn't, wasn't much to look at. It looked like a paddock full of sheep, full of wooden posts with wires dangling between it. They needed the sheep to keep the grass down because the poles are too close together to get a lawnmower in there. Uh, so just a whole bunch of wires dangling on posts all over the place. Most of the clever stuff was in the, um, the receivers at the end that connected the signals from these things. And what this telescope was capable of doing was looking for very rapid changes in signals, which is what they were expecting for scintillation. Yeah, so Paul, a uh, uh, young woman at the time, Jocelyn Bell was doing her PhD, was looking at the signal, and it turns out that this was a fixed telescope. And so it looked up into the sky, and as the sky went by, different quasars or radio sources would come into view, and you could look at them for a little bit and see how they might twinkle. But then they had a source come by that uh, Jocelyn Bell realized looked kind of funny. It sort of had, it was scruffy. It had sort of a, a, a pattern that kind of looked fuzzy and didn't look like anything else. And they wondered what it was, and they changed how they read the radio signals, because before they were looking at something every couple seconds, and they looked at it at much higher resolution. And when they did that, they saw a ping, a ping every 1.33 seconds. And that was why, what would be going ping in the cosmos? Ping, and then ping, and then ping every 1.33 seconds. Yeah, and very regularly. Mm. I mean, and if I ever see that and observe, which you do occasionally, you see something flashing like that, you think, you know, it's a, it's a satellite or a plane going over. So sure, they must have thought early on that it was some sort of terrestrial interference, but they were soon able to rule that out. Yes, because the interesting part of this is that, remember, this is looking up into the sky, and so one day you'll see it, and then it'll go around, the Earth will rotate, you won't see it. And then you'll see it, and when they saw it come up the next day, they saw it. 20, 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds later, and that number rings a bell to we astronomers because that is what we call the sidereal revolution time of the Earth rather than the time it takes to rotate back to the same place on the Sun. Yes, you'd think that the Earth rotates every 24 hours, but in fact it's a little bit different than that. That's how long it takes for the Sun to come back to the same place as seen from us. But because we're going around the Sun, it's one part in 365 different. And that small difference was what they were seeing. So that meant that whatever this was, it wasn't on Earth. Because anything on Earth, like you know, the milk float or someone jamming, you know, someone turning on their phone receiver at the same time, would be at the same calendar time, not the same sidereal time, unless it was another astronomer, perhaps. That's right. So what would be coming from space going ping at 1.33 seconds almost exactly? Well, they made a joke of it being little green men, but it turned out to be something far more interesting, I think. Yeah, judging by um, Sam Bell's memoirs about this time, they were actually, they didn't seriously think it was aliens to begin with, but then they, for a while they got started to think, well, maybe it is, maybe we should be telling the Prime Minister or something about this. Uh, but then eventually they discovered a second bit of scruff somewhere else, and this time they found uh, another one of these pulsing signals of a different period, and before long they were these were being found all over the place. At that point it became clear it wasn't going to be aliens, they weren't going to be all over the place. There had to be something natural. But what is there that's going to be natural out in deep space beyond our solar system? It's putting out a lot of power to pick up radio signals here, but it will do a ping every half a second or every 1.3 seconds or something like that. So you can imagine something pulsing, but, you know, probably aren't big capacitors or something in space that we would make things pulse here on Earth. So maybe we could have something rotating, and for whatever reason there's a hot spot on it, that every time it rotates, you'd see it. Or some sort of eclipse that goes around or something like that. But even so, it's very fast. I mean, we think you, uh, like an exoplanet that goes around the sun in four days is hooning around, going at some enormous speed. 
you know, 1.3 seconds. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Wouldn't it just fling itself to pieces from the centrifugal force? Well, I think the Earth certainly would. So maybe we need to do a calculation and see exactly what we're up against here. Okay, so let's do that calculation.